Blank Street Coffee. That's a a two-and-a-half-year-old coffee chain based in New York. They just closed a $20 million investment round that included Tiger Global and General Catalyst. That's less than the $67 million that it raised in 2021, but still impressive considering basically no one is raising venture funding right now. Um, Blank Street's business model is pretty intriguing. Uh, Each store is an average of 350 square feet, and the coffee-making process is almost entirely automated. So that allows them to charge prices almost 25% lower than Starbucks, but they're still really profitable. They've opened more than 40 locations in New York, and they've all been profitable within a month of opening. So, Scott, can we just get your first-glance marketing professor branding take? Um, What do you think of this business? Well, I love it. I love it. One, because I I love caffeine and I love coffee. I wish one of the things I regret about growing up is it's it's amazing that the propaganda you're exposed to and the music you're exposed to somewhere between the ages of like 15 and 24 really get purchase. Right. Mm -hmm. I was listening to Tom Petty and ELO and George Michael in the cars. And, you know, as long as it's one of those bands playing for me, I don't, you know, I, I forget everything else. That's fine, <laughs> right? And also uh, the propaganda around smoking really mm. had an impact on me. There was a ton of it. And also uh, it ultimately took my mother's life. So I've always been vehemently anti-tobacco. Uh, and one of the pieces of propaganda that that really stuck with me is somewhere we were played one of these films in high school about the evils of coffee and caffeine. Mm. And it was in Coca-Cola and it was in coffee. And I never, I didn't have a single cup of coffee until I was 40. Oh my God, did I Whoa. fuck up. <laughs> coffee is wonderful. I mean, it is like, and now I wake up and I'm like, I hate everything about the morning except for one thing. And that is my latte with my whole milk. None of this PBS woke bullshit, coconut, whatever (laughs) milk, just basic whole milk from some cow they're about to slaughter. Anyways, (laughs) I love coffee. And what's interesting, I love the evolution of coffee. People used to chew on uh, intoxicants or be high because if you're plowing fields, that's pretty awful work. It helps to be high. And you didn't doing kind of rote manual labor. You could be a little bit high. But then his work moved to more of an information-based economy where you were doing ledgers or calligraphy or, or you were in information work. You couldn't be high. So they came up with a new drug called caffeine. And Michael Pollan, who is my Yoda on all substances, I asked him in the podcast that, where we interviewed him, I said, is there a free lunch anywhere? Because I haven't found it. I love the way alcohol makes me feel. I don't love the way it makes me feel the next day. And he said, the closest thing we have to a free lunch is caffeine. That it looks like it might have some health benefits. It gets you going. It makes you happier. It makes you more productive. And it might actually be good for you. By the way, something that really disappoints me on the other side of the spectrum, remember all the studies showing that one glass of wine a night was good for you? It ends up all of that shit has been totally debunked and any amount of alcohol, any amount of alcohol is bad for you. I'm totally into this guy named Dr. Peter Attia that I found on Tim on Tim Ferriss's podcast. It's a yeah. fantastic podcast and Tim does a great job of going very deep with this guy. Anyway, there is Caffeine. I love Caffeine. Back to this company. This company's <laughs> brand mission is cultural. Yeah. And that is, it pays people, I think about 28 bucks an hour, including tips. And while I was out there harping around how minimum wage absolutely needs to be increased, that if it just kept pace with productivity, it'd be 23 bucks an hour right now. The market, um, just really did its job. And that is that where you've seen wages accelerate for the first time in like 40 years is at the lower income levels, our frontline workers. So if someone can do a great job and have good EQ and work hard, which a lot of frontline workers do in a a food services setting and make 28 bucks an hour, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And the company still does well. And the fact that VCs are funding a company like this that has both a great product and I would argue, you know, kind of good, you know, good paying jobs for, you know, semi-skilled labor, if you will. I, I, I like this a lot. I'm real happy about it. What are your thoughts? Well, the thing that I was finding interesting is that this is basically the, the anti-Starbucks. I mean, Starbucks pioneered this whole idea of you go to the coffee store and you sit in your chair and you have high-speed internet and you 
talk with strangers and you hang out basically. I mean, that what you talk about this idea of the third place, Starbucks kind of pioneered that and they invested in, in, you know, nice decorations and artwork and a cozy setting. <laughs> Blank Street's basically just done a total 180. They're, they're operating out of these tiny little trucks, 350 square feet. Um, you don't hang out there. You get your coffee. It's automated. Two seconds, the barista is a low-skilled worker who doesn't need any r- real training. Uh, and then you're out of there. And I wonder if that's sort of going to be the the bellwether for where consumer brands are going to start moving is that actually people just want total total efficiency. They don't necessarily want to hang out and chill. Um, and it's funny how the coffee industry has, it, it might be about to change. And I wonder if this will make a sort of iconic business case study. Well, when you guys told me about this, it sounded almost like a meth dealer. You, uh, you want to cook crystal meth? And a meth dealer <laughs> is... All right, come here. Here's your stuff. Here's your drug. Give me the money. Now get the fuck out of here. I mean, <laughs> they don't want you to hang out, right? Yeah. Um, it's g- g- let's do this. You want this drug. I want your money. Let's make this as efficient and fr- frictionless as possible. And that's mm. what this model kind of reminded me of. Uh, now, the, the business learning here is the following, is that when a company like Starbucks or Amazon is so successful Everybody starts benchmarking everything they do and everyone piles in and invests Mm. in everything that Amazon and Starbucks does in every way. (laughs) And what happens is it becomes like Florida real estate in the sense that that business strategy becomes over-invested. And it creates an opportunity for someone to come in and zag when everyone else is zigging. So for example, Amazon was all about, it's our platform, we make you advertise, we do the fulfillment and slowly but surely, we it's our data, we own the consumer, we get to decide what goes in the box, it's all Amazon branding and you know we will dictate your terms and you're just fortunate to be on the world's largest e-commerce platform. Shopify comes in and says, we're gonna zag. You own the data, you own the customer, mm-hmm. you own the packaging. We turn on, we make totally transparent. We are just a service provider. We we make transparent everything. We're, we are the anti-Amazon. And the company becomes one of the most valuable companies in the history of Canada. One of the most, um, one of the biggest performers or best performers mm-hmm. on the NASDAQ. Starbucks says, hang out. It's all about that Italian coffee feel. Stay as long as you want. And someone goes in and says, no, nope, we're the meth dealer. <laughs> Get We're the, the meth dealer. <laughs> Here's your drug. Get the fuck out of here. And there's always opportunity, and it's inspiring. When everyone's barking up the same tree, when Florida real estate gets over-invested, that's the time. That's the time to move in and zag. Um, so, Scott, I was talking to a soft bank investor last night, and they basically told me that they haven't written a check in nine months. <laughs> and they, they just don't have a job. They're still getting paid. Uh, but they sit around doing nothing. And whenever they try to bring a deal to investment committee, they say, no, bad macro environment. We're not really looking for deals right now. Uh, but thanks for doing this anyway. Um, the venture market is just totally stagnant right now. But it feels like, you know, you've got a consumer facing coffee brand that's raising a $20 million round. Do you think that could be the moment that sort of reinvigorates the, the venture market, especially the consumer venture market? Probably not. What's going on in the venture market is similar to what's going on in the housing market. And that is entrepreneurs who raised their last round at a billion dollars still haven't come to grips with the fact that their company may be worth 200 million now. Mm -hmm. So just as Bob, who saw, you know, uh, you know, Eric down the road, sell his house for one and a half million at the height of the frenzy, thinks their house is worth one and a half and won't take 1.2 there's just a standoff in the private markets. And also uh, the venture capitalists have been understandably very distracted with other things right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they'll just, time is on their side. It's not like a deal's gonna get away from them uh, because people are piling in. SoftBank uh, will go down as the worst venture capitalist in history. (laughs) Series after series of just ridiculously stupid uh, ideas. Oh, this is a terrible investment that makes no sense. I know, let's shovel another 200 million into it and try and pursue capital as a strategy. It's almost like a, I mean, it's literally like Ponzi, institutionalizing Ponzi scheme. If we keep sending higher and higher signals, if we keep, you know, it's like the ultimate wash trading. If we keep investing at a higher multiple, the greater fool will come in and take it away. This Mm -hmm. is 
this venture firm or SoftBank will go down in history is arguably the worst managed investment vehicle uh, in history that didn't involve um, that didn't involve fraud. So I remember we had a guy from SoftBank, this lovely young man at the Pivot Conference, you know, exactly a year ago, saying we're just getting started. And on stage was some company he'd backed at you know three billion times revenues. It's like really just getting started. This this shit's insane. What what are you talking about? But you're gonna what's ex, what what is in, the most encouraging thing about this is that it's great to see venture capital firms investing in great consumer concepts and not trying to pretend it's some sort of technology solution. And that is, there's a lot of opportunities for kind of main street startups, if you will, that offer, maybe they don't offer the parabolic returns of a SaaS company, but SaaS has been so over-invested that there might be underinvestment again, see above zagging when everyone's zigging yeah. in some consumer companies. So I like consumer, I like when venture capitalists get into great consumer companies. I think it's good for the economy and good for job growth. Typically, these companies have more employees uh, 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 per revenue. Typically, these companies have more employees based on the size of the company than tech companies. So uh, I like it when these companies come into the consumer market. But this, there's still some, there's still some sitting on your hands for a while here. The yeah. market, I think, in the private markets are going to stay kind of locked for a little while.